offensive as the racism <laughs> conversation or worse. Yeah, and probably I would think there's probably be a good idea to maybe stop it, but uh, but I'm I'm willing to kind of go there. But, but I don't you... think I think we should stop this line. But Kara, I love what you were saying that led up to this, so I want to give you a chance to finish. Nuance Ho. Hey everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Kara Burrell. Sometimes I go by Nuance Ho. Sometimes I go by Holy Rudder of a Nose. But what they miss is sacred buoys for tits. This video is going to be a little bit of everything. It's got some juicy parts. It's going to be my favorite video to date. I have a lot to say. I also have a history with these people, with uh, this faction of Mormonism. And I feel like it's time to talk um, more specifically about the interview that I did with Rod Meldrum, um, including some exact clips of when I said in my head, I'm quitting. I'm out of here. I'm knocking out that door. I don't have to do this. I don't want to do this. Maybe not even good at this. And uh, so it's actually not for the reasons that anyone thinks it is. So I'm going to get into that in a sec. And then that also leads into a bit of a discussion about my former coworker. She's the one who took over my role at Mormon Stories um, after I left. And people want me to comment on her suing the OSF for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that kind of explains some things about why I left and if her arguments have any validity. But this video was going to be on the broader topic of logic, evidence, reason, and its sworn enemy, Hannah Stoddard, Rod Meldrum, Russ Barlow, Dean Sessions, uh, and just this entire clan of Mormons who I met when I attended the Book of Mormon evidence conference at the insistence of my parents. I have a few viral videos that I've shared on TikTok and YouTube of what was said at that conference. So you might know what I'm talking about, how evolution is a satanic conspiracy, uh, what's really at the core of the earth, because we know it can't be magma because that would be the rational, logical thing to conclude. So you have a bunch of very ultra right wing, very conservative Mormons with like 17 American flags on the stage with uh, a literalist interpretation of scripture. So what do they have to say? And then of course, at the head of this clan is Rod Meldrum. Mm. Rod Meldrum uh, from the Firm Foundation, proponent of the Heartland model, and was my famous last interview at Mormon Stories. And a big part of the reason that I think this video is really important, I want you to see why all of these Mormons need to be called out and where this type of thinking leads. If you are a member of the LDS church, I absolutely welcome your thoughts on how this faction of Mormonism that I think should be called out, what they're up to, what they believe in, uh, the logical fallacies that they engage in. I totally welcome any believers uh, thoughts on how this faction, this clan uh, differs from your beliefs. If you don't want to engage in my arguments, like I said, I will be going over a lot of logical fallacies. Pick your favorite one. Absolutely, you have my permission to fully hurl them at me as long as you comment which one you're using at the bottom. Just give a source to which one. Ad hominem is the Mormon comment section's favorite one. So my nose is large and crooked. It's so crooked, in fact, I got it from the church's attorneys, Kurt McConkie. I'm going to bring all of my abilities to research and all my abilities to drop out of UVU here for you. <laughs> If you um, like what I do and you want me to keep making videos like this, please consider tipping a few dollars a month over on my Patreon. I have a donor box. I have a Venmo. Those will all be linked below. People making small donations really means that I can stay sustainable with this channel and roll out new content weekly. So thank you to my Patreon supporters. Thanks to my hoes. So as a lot of you might know, I was the producer and co-host over at Mormon Stories for about a year from 2021 into 2022. And things were, things were chugging along just fine in a lot of ways. I needed to be home with my kids. And I, when I'm focused on something, I just put my whole heart into it. And so Mormon Stories overall is just a very demanding job. I, w I was excited for this interview. My mom really wanted Rod Meldrum to come on and, and defend his beliefs in the Heartland model. That means the Book of Mormon peoples, literally all these wars, the civilization taking place right here in the Great Lakes region, the middle of the country, Oklahoma, stuff like that. But we got into all kinds of other topics. Because uh, let's just take a second to explain the way that rational thinking works is that you have to pick a conclusion that has the least amount of conjecture, the least amount of allowances. So what that means is that we choose the answer 
when we're figuring out what is true, if we choose an answer that is less than rational, we are choosing to be crazy by taking that conclusion. And uh, Bill Real and I have done a video before and he explains this idea where like if you're camping out in the woods in a cabin and you hear a noise on the top of the roof and it could be a lot of things and your brain can make up a story and your brain can say either, you know, hey, that's a raccoon or hey, that's a pine cone falling off or hey, that's just the wind rattling or your brain could say, hey, that's an alien and, and there's an alien spaceship landing <laughs> in the middle of the woods coming to abduct me now. And if you're in your bedroom at night and you hear a noise, you're like, well, I'm going to go what you're going to do. I'm going to go. It's, it's, I'm going to go fight an alien right now. So if you know that there's the, the most likely, the, the Occam's razor of what is most likely to be true, there's the most rational answer. There's less rational answers. But if you are taking the less rational answer, you are choosing to be crazy. You are choosing an irrational conclusion. And to be irrational is to be crazy when you are, when you're going through these, these thoughts and they're begging their brain, they're begging you to make allowances. And there's this this famous uh, tale given, who's an apologist for the church, where he says, with this interview with John DeLynn, where he says, if you just, if, if you can only just make allowances, and the second that you admit that you need to make allowances, you're admitting that you are coming from a rotten foundation. You're saying, we'll just create a space that still allows me to be faithful. And then more than that, the the, the more absurd of the allowances that you have to make. Well, if we just say this happened and then that happened, this could happen. And we have all this special pleading where um, normally God would act in this way, but in this one special way, he's actually acting in this way that allows for me to maintain this belief over and over again. You're, you're to maintain this belief system in Mormonism. You're it's not just once or twice. It's a thousand different ways. You have to always take the least rational point of view. And I'm not stupid here. I know that all across the world, people, make allowances and they uh, choose less than rational things. But when we're talking about religion and specifically this brand of very fundamentalist religion, it's, it's not because it's actually true to these people. They think that it is, but it's because that we have these cognitive biases that have been part of our, our makeup and identity as human beings that our brain will make up excuses for things so that we can continue to believe the thing that it's most advantageous for us and our tribe to believe in. And that's why we've survived for, for millions of years because we collaborated together and there's a common goal and there's one tribe that believes this and our tribe believes that. And you have to be able to collaborate around some type of uniformity. It's, it's been beneficial to be able to have these blind spots so that we can work together more cohesively. Um, but then you get to the point where when do the when do the benefits of this cohesion outweigh the risks? And in this interview, uh, I think it's pretty clear that people who do not understand how to, to take the most rational point of view of what scientists say, whether we're talking about the age of the earth and what that means for our species and what that means evolutionarily when you have homosexuals that are part of our species, all of these things they all tie together because it all comes down to how you treat people, how you vote, how you treat people in your family who leave the church. All of this has bigger ramifications outside of just this guy believes some kooky things. This girl believes some kooky things like Joseph Smith being a treasure digger and inventing the Mormon church. And it just turned out to not be a true thing. And people just didn't believe it so dogmatically. That would be one thing. That'd be all fine and good. But there are peoples, there are families that are torn apart by these things by this inability to recognize irrational thought in themselves, that families are broken up over it. And so then you have a prophetic mantle of prophets saying these things that are also very dogmatic. And so it's just this, this slip and slide of, of people who have never gotten a grasp on what it means to have a, a critical critique, a critical thought, um, who recognize what a fallacious argument looks like that they wouldn't put up with if Warren Jeffs did it, if another cult leader in a different church did it, uh, they make all of the allowances for themselves, but they can recognize them in other systems and call them out and say, well, that it's not true when they do it. But when we're fundamentalist about our interpretation of scripture, we're doing it the right way because the spirit that we have, we are on the inside. This is the right. This is the correct one. And that's that's been human civilization has always had this reactionary to 
view to when society changes and things get more diverse, you will always have a reactionary. You'll always have a fundamentalist faction of whatever the mainstream is going towards. And so whatever you think about Mormonism, evangelicals and ultra right wing Mormons, there are people who still view that mainstream as still too entrenched with Satan <laughs> that they need to even go further right. They need to go further into fundamentalism, into a more literal interpretation. And all of these fallacies, what are they designed to do? They are just designed to dismiss the evidence. They're designed to deflect it and obfuscate and, and confuse. And you'll see that all throughout me talking to Rod here, that there's, there's no internal like reflection, open-mindedness. So then this is where we get into the clip. Okay, so this is the section of my interview at Mormon Stories with Rod Meldrum that is is the thing. This is the whole point. You know where I'm going with this. Trigger warning, I am going to play the clip of Rod saying the things. The things are about to be said. So John shares that like, well, some people think like it doesn't really matter if you need to even get converted in this life or even if your kids and family are leave the church and become apostates. So they'll just go to the lowest tier of heaven. We'll see them in spirit prison. They can just rejoin the church then and it'll all be fine. And then Rod goes into this explanation about, well, people like me, I'm just giving people evidence and I'm just a guy throwing starfish back in. Rod tells the story about how two guys are walking down the beach and one of them sees all these dying starfish that have washed up and he starts hucking them back into the salt water and the other guy's like you think you're gonna make a difference because there's like thousands of starfish they're all gonna die and he's like if i can just save this one and this one that's all that really matters and that's how rod sees himself it'll make a difference in their life maybe they'll get like that starfish and get flung back in the water and be able to, to live on what if <sighs> and then this is where i come in with uh, have you ever thought that no have you ever thought that maybe not? Um, have you ever thought that maybe hold on? To, to your analogy, though, what if the starfish going into the water is is kind of what you're analogous to, like, giving them evidence to believe in the true church, right? To stay in, yeah. That's your analogy. Yeah. But what if the starfish are being flung into something that is not salt water and it's fresh water <laughs> and it's actually poison or acid <laughs> and it's actually but rod i'm serious about this one what about mm -hmm. if you're actually not helping people live their best lives and their most fully actualized most christ-like most honest authentic lives you're giving people evidence to be more dogmatic in their beliefs and more divisive and less loving to their friends and family who don't believe have you considered that point that what uh, you that's that that the very thing that you're upholding is yeah. causing people, I'm not saying you're racist, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> is causing people to believe racist things because they believe the evidence of the Book of Mormon supports it, or they are becoming yeah. more dogmatic. They're well, more that, hateful towards gay people now yeah. because they think that that's what the God wants them to, that your evidence is making families be torn apart because everything revolves around, you didn't bless your baby, you're not baptizing your kids, you're wearing a tank top, <laughs> you're drinking coffee, that your evidence yeah. Okay. Is caused his laughter shows that he understands the severity of my question. Causing <laughs> harm, it's a freshwater okay. starfish. I, I I think that I addressed that in the very first when I was in the farm and so forth, and, and, and something that's not something that would actually damage people's lives, and uh, and 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 something that's not true. If it isn't true, then I don't want to be out there promoting it. Right? If it's if it isn't true, would you have any ability to listen to the evidence that it isn't true? Are you actually in a space where you're open? Of course you're not. Of course you're not. And that's when I had the experience that I, that I already told you about, which is uh, the, you know that I um, the church is good. Had the experience that I knew that it was true. So and all of this is hinging around the Holy Ghost. So let's let's lay out some some logical things here for a second. That's the that's why somebody on the screen said, Kara, that's the question of the night. Thank you so much. And that's leads into this other important thing that I didn't even bring up to Rod. Of course he wouldn't be able to get it. But that this is the entire discussion is about the epistemology of how you know what's true and what critical thinking actually means. And so Rod in our previous interview talks about having a spiritual experience where like his car wasn't starting, something that's like it has to be God or whatever. Um, 
that he had this experience when he was a young man. And so all of that has led him to believe that this church is true and this is the work he should be engaged in. And I'm over here being like, Hey, did you ever think that just because it works for you, it works for you. Um, but it actually bolsters too much of a dogmatic belief that actually really harms a lot of other people. No, never thought of it. Hmm. Go figure. So there is at no point in talking to people like this, right? Um, I don't need to tell you. There are, th there are certain indicators with certain people, religious people specifically, that tell you that there is no piece of data that they will ever allow to come in and change their mind. And you could take all the data, all the data that is available, their brain is only going to allow them to fit it into the assumptions that they already have. And they will do that till they die. Starting from the conclusion that, that Mormonism is true. And then every indication that you'll see in these interviews, uh, that they will always have to end up with the belief that Mormonism is true. And that's, that's how you operate in the world. And there's this famous joke that right-wingers like to say that like liberals are so open-minded that their brains fall out. Ha 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 ha. To me, being open-minded, it basically just means that you are not starting with your conclusion already fixed in your head. So yes, I think that that is a valuable thing to push for in society. Hey, leave the church, leave it alone. You have people like this who are extremely dogmatic, that have wide ramifications, that preach things that are, if you're, if you're part of the church, don't you want the most Christian version of, and the most rational, the one that you could actually hold up in an argument with other people? Do you actually, do you want people like Rod Meldrum? <laughs> to be out there as Mormons saying that this is what our church believes in. This is how we act. This is how we think. And so can we not all as just people just say like, if you are starting with your conclusion already fixed in your head and what the data says doesn't matter what I decide, as opposed to people who don't have an, the, the assumption about what is, what is true about the world. And they do let the data decide what type of person, take it out of Mormonism, take it to a different religion. Which one do you actually want to be around. Anything is possible. Anything can be explained enough and you can achieve the ability to sleep at night <laughs> if you throw in enough conjecture and, and you're motivated to reason your way to that point. So with talking with religious people, I always do try to start with the acknowledgement that they have experiences that to them they have interpreted as meaning there is this God and he has this message. This is what he wants me to do. And I can fully grant that you are feeling something. And so when you're talking about critical thinking, everybody, you need some sort of data set, you need some type of measurement. And since an eternal internal experience is going to be unmeasurable to the rest of us, so while I can agree that you're feeling something, we could put you in an MRI machine right now and the parts of your brain will light up in correspondence with what's going on inside your body. And what you're interpreting is this is Jehovah and this is the Mormon God and he wants me to act in this way. But that is just your conjecture about the feeling that I grant that you have. But that feeling could also lights up the same if you're gambling and you can have a feeling that you should put all of that money on black, you know, but it's all just conjecture about what God you already think exists, telling you what you already think that God would want you to do when there's, there's a bunch of possibilities. We're not ruling out the, that all, have you ruled out that Allah is trying to tell you something? Have you ruled out that Buddha is trying to tell you something? So human civilization, we didn't start off by just thinking that like, there is a God. He wants to tell me this. We start off by what we can measure. What is the data around us? And what are our theories about what that stuff around us and in us is doing and how we interact with that environment? So when you see a mountain, you think, how did that mountain get there? When you see the sun rising and some people's theories are like, oh, that's God pulling a chariot <laughs> across the sky. People have always had theories about their environment, about what's going on. And sometimes the best explanation is like lightning, there's a God who's throwing lightning around until better alternative theories come along. And then when you have a better explanation that has less space allowed for conjecture and superstitious thinking, you go with the better explanation, the one that requires less conjecture or else you are being irrational. And, and it doesn't matter what your theory says. And then there's all kinds of religious people and, and believers and apologists who want to make 
the argument that their theory for what's happening in the environment that they are conjecturing <laughs> is the case that is factual, that this is the actual real state of the world. While we can't prove it right now at a later point in time, um, the position I hold right now, I am acknowledging is kind of weak, but with enough data, with enough things, it will be proven without realizing that that position is irrational. That position is not helpful without acknowledging what we can all see that, okay, so you're admitting that your theory is irrational. You're justifying it now with evidence not yet attained. And that in religious systems is seen as very virtuous, where I would say, now that I left the church, that I want to live in the present moment where I base my beliefs on what has happened, what I know, instead of an idea of what I think will happen, what I hope will happen based on no indication whatsoever, based on a completely faith-based, am I going to operate my entire life based on what other people tell me um, they think is going to happen, that I'm going to get burned up, that I am going to die if I don't pay my tithing to Russell M. Nelson in the great day of burning? <laughs> am I going to live my life like that? Leaders of the church would sometimes tell you that's what you should be doing. Um, that would be insane to operate my life like that. Because what I just said, you can believe anything on that rationale. You can follow any theory on that. And if you're in a strong enough of an echo chamber and you grow up with people and that's all they ever tell, to you, tell you and you see a bunch of other adults acting completely irrationally, you think that that's just a normal way to live without realizing you're taking crazy pills. And that's what's, that's what's so fascinating about this entire <laughs> psychoanalysis is that people in this system, they think that they are more virtuous because they have faith in something that is demonstrably false to everyone else, totally unlikely, absolutely absurd, out there off the deep end. But it's almost as if the more absurd of the thing that you have to believe, therefore, the more virtuous you look because it, you just need more faith. You just need more faith to believe that the, the further away we are from what's known by the world, what's known by mainstream science, you know how they like to lie for Satan. You make up all these conspiracies and the further you get away from that, the more kookier theories are, the more virtue you have. You know, people will be like, oh, well, you, you people, you know, non-believers, they have faith in all kinds of stuff. Um, I don't have superstitious faith. I have inductive reasoning from how things have gone that when I walk down the street, the ground will hold me, that gravity is a thing. There's there's faith like that, maybe. But then there's faith as a virtue. You can have as much conjecture as you want. You can have as many allowances. You can move the goalposts as many times as you feel like, as long as you still get to end up with the position that you held at the beginning. And that is what it means to be an irrational <laughs> fundamentalist, religious Mormon. That is when you come in the door and you want to sign. That's what they say. They, they ask you, could you believe anything? The way your brain works right now, could we tell you anything and you would believe it? And then you have to go, yeah, because there's absolutely no position um, I couldn't justify with uh, the way that my brain works or actually doesn't work right now. So and these people think that they're in the know. There's that saying, there's a there's a no true Scotsman fallacy that God will make himself known to true seekers. The religious person like this, the Mormon person like this that needs to be stopped can, can rationalize and conjecture their way through and make allowances through any single theory that they come up with as long as it comes back that the church is true, that they are on the inside, they are in the know. And if it's advantageous for them to use the bandwagon fallacy of like, well, everybody out there in the world are all corrupt and evil. Our group, we're insular, we're safe, we're in the know, we're God's special chosen people. God reveals himself and makes his, his the, the true seekers God will reveal himself to. That's like a phrase within religion and Mormonism, right? So the, the outside world, those people are just jumping on the bandwagon. They don't know. And then by the same token, how can this many people be wrong? That's a big thing in Mormonism, a big thing that people say to me, my parents say to me that like, do you really think, look how good and sincere Rod is. Look how good and sincere Hannah is. These are good people. Their fruits are so good. Could they possibly be wrong? Could the thousands of people at this conference possibly be led astray? A million Muslims can't be wrong. Like, I believe that with all my heart. I used he to believe, believe it? Or I believe that he believes it. And I used to believe that with okay. all of my heart. I believed that the fruits of the gospel were true and they okay. did all of the same things that you said. 
And I had to recognize that I'm saying that as a person who's white, who's never had to deal with racist people in the church. And yeah, so I started listening to what black members of the church had to say and other people of the church. And I said, okay, the fruits of the church for you have been rotten. Okay. Started listening to trans people, started listening to gay people. The fruits of the church was not happiness. It was devastation and it was divisiveness and it was suicide ideation. So I had to listen to people who were fundamentally born gay and say the fruits for them, the God's plan was not good. I listened to a lot of women, listened to a lot of people who um, felt like Mormonism stopped them from progressing because they were not of the right gender. And I started listening again. I wasn't a feminist. I was never a progressive Mormon, not once. I went from being as a very conservative Mormon, anti-feminist. So I started listening <laughs> that a yeah. lot of people were hurt by the church and all of the fruits that I saw was just, mm, I like to see the happy families. I'm going to ignore the crying ones. I like to see the people serving. I'm going to ignore the ones who are going to serve dead people in the temple and not the ones of other faiths and other religions who also are doing great things ser serving in soup kitchens. Sure. So all I'm trying to say is like, it's really easy to say like, yeah, we're upholding something that is true because of the fruits, but it's only easy to say that because from my perspective, I hadn't talked to enough people. I hadn't talked to enough people to see that the fruits are super easy to see when you, when you look through a worldview like this and you're ignoring all of the crying, all of the suicides, you're ignoring everything else. So I just want to caution you, <laughs> sorry to make it so serious, caution you from saying that. In, in, like empirically, emphatically, you can say that it works for you. You can say that the Heartland model bolsters your testimony and it bolsters other people's testimony. But to say that the fruits are empirically good is something that I can't allow. <laughs> I, I think so, so in this section, uh, I ask Rod to give me an example of what is a choice that people make that puts them at odds with the commandments where the fruits of the church are good. It's just that their choices make them think that the fruits are rotten because they can't live in a way where they get to do what they want, you know? And his example is, well, somebody might have a strong instinct to go out and kill, thou shall not kill, and that's going to put them at odds and they're going to feel great about killing. <laughs> you have to separate a little bit the fruits of the church from people's um different choices and how it makes people feel i mean basically when you whenever you go against truth it's not comfortable or whenever you go against the the, the precepts of god it's not comfortable no no and, no and, no and, what i'm and, saying and, is and, what i'm saying so is it, it that the priesthood is only as... for men and not for women that's not people's choices that's the structure of the church that's what that is i'm saying but that is the fruit reason? Is there, hurts is there women and men well, why, why is there two different sexes? I mean. A sperm and egg have to come together. One has to carry okay, but, the but child. Why, but, but, it, it, but assuming that God created man and woman in his image, right? Why was there two? Why, didn't, why not make it just easy and just do one and just have it so that they can do asexual you know, reproduction like some animals do? I think evolution tells us the answers to that. But I'm saying... You're, you tried well, to make the point, though, that like people's choices are the bad fruit. And I'm saying, no, Rod, yeah. it's not just people's choice. Some people make bad choices within the church, but some people from the very structure that they live in day to day, feeling suffocated because of their gender identity or sexual orientation or the mm -hmm. color of their skin mm -hmm. or them being a woman or a man, that there are certain expectations that the church's structure puts on them. That they live yeah. every day. There, there's some cultural aspects that I think you're right. Okay. But there's also uh, some assumptions that I think are incorrect. And, uh, and, and we probably don't want to go down that rabbit hole particularly, but, but I just say that, you know, that when you, when you see, when you talk about the fruit, um, does it cause more pain for some people? Um, based on the decisions that they make and the things that they that they feel about different things, um, will put them at odds with the commandments. What can you I mean, make, that, what like a decision? Well, like, well like, like, let's say for example, example. Uh, that, you know, the, the, the commandment says, "Thou shalt not kill," right, or, or take take innocent blood. Well, somebody who goes out and kills someone, 
um, may feel pretty darn uncomfortable about uh, about that commandment, don't you think? Very God, few people God are said murderers. Not to kill, so. and then, <laughs> Name something else. <laughs> no, no, this, 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 but it, something it, that is everybody that people do. Though. It's an I'm example. talking about things. It's an extreme example. I would, extreme I would admit. examples aren't helpful though because we're talking about the reasons but why people is, live, why people find the religion toxic. It. Rod, Rod. It's people don't find it. people. People do not find the church suffocating and the fruits rotten because mm. we're not allowed to murder. That's okay. not what I'm talking All about. Right, let's, let's, let's take another one. Let's take pedophilia. People don't okay. find the church toxic because we're not allowed to be okay. pedophiles. If, I'm if, so, if somebody find the wants to be, because if somebody not really to be feels that I am, I was born a pedophile, yeah, and this I just is not a good like example, Rod. <laughs> sex with, <laughs> little, with little kids. Rod, this so is far. not a good and example. It makes me uncomfortable when the church talks about pedophilia as being wrong, and therefore I'm going to go out and commit, you know, suicide because I feel Rod, uncomfortable about the church. Rod, that's not a good example. Hold on, Rod, that's okay. a good example. Why not? Use the one that I What's wrong with the example? Because nobody leaves the church. Nobody. On mass. Well, you said about sexual orientation. One of the sexual orientations is pedophilia, right? It's not. Yes or no? A, not or bestiality. A, How about no. bestiality? If I want to have sex with a goat. Okay. Um, Let's stick on the ones if that, that If that makes me suicidal because I want to have sex with a goat and the church says that's wrong. <laughs> Let's just stick on. Let's right, stick on the just, and then John has to jump in and he's like, a lot of people in the comment section are losing their minds right now because of what you just compared. Uh, homosexuals too loving your line of questioning I'm gonna say that it's deeply offensive to the lgbtq community for you to be putting them in the same conversation and he's like yeah files and as people and then god goes like yeah because they're people hate re people who rebel against god they just they don't want to hear the truth that's literally what he just says they have mainstream wait um, can you stop can you stop and just absorb what i just said that, that I, I have LGBT, I have LGBT people yeah. right now that are listening and watching, right? And they're saying it's deeply offensive to invoke the LGBTQ community in the same line of reasoning as pedophiles and people who engage in bestiality. Can you sit with that for a second and think about how that's coming off to other people? And Rod's thinking in his head. I can tell he's like. Well, how it's coming off to people who live in sin is that they don't like hearing uncomfortable truths. It, there's no reflection. There's nothing. And probably it's not a comfortable feeling. And I'm just, I'm having inner panic right now. And I was like, my parents have given so much money to this guy. This is, this is who, this is where this line of, of completely void of rational thoughts placing so much virtue in absurd conclusions, whether it's the Heartland model or thinking that the earth has a core of water because Noah's floodwaters had to go somewhere. All of these things, they all are in a system where non-critical thinking is encouraged. And what is, what's more virtuous than having the most absurd thought possible? The more you can tell someone's virtue in Mormonism, in this in this clan of Mormonism, by how absurd their thought is. They're like, I am speaking so much truth to power right now. I'm going to call gay people pedophiles and engaging in bestiality. That those they're all they're all just things that that they're rebelling against God. All those people rebel against God. So like the yeah. love you have for your wife, and she has for you. You have to mention you're deeply, madly in love, right? We're talking about something that's analogous. The love two men have for each other and want to commit their lives to each other. Is that, is that people, we're trying to, I'm trying to actually so do analogies that are actually on point. Uh, you're saying that you're throwing starfish back in right. and that the Heartland model helps give evidence to people being able to have a bolstered testimony yeah, in this faithful. one restored church. Yeah. But I just asked again, like, what if, that's fresh water and it's not salt water. What if it's throwing that starfish into a bowl and it's not? Have you ever sat and actually thought about like, there are some people who the evidence, let's say that there's a family and the parents believe the evidence of the Heartland model and it bolsters their testimony. But what it does is it creates a freshwater lake that their children of starfish are living in that they can't breathe in now because one of them is gay. And one of them uh, doesn't like the idea of living as a polygamist in the next life. Or in the other one, <laughs> they have legitimate problems with the structure that causes them to suffocate. So that's my that's the root of my question is like, 
what if upholding this Heartland model makes people not as happy as you think that they are? Are you willing to listen to people who say that? Whenever you go against principles of truth, okay, that it is going to be difficult, okay? And it's going to be uncomfortable. Now, the, I mean, if, again, if you take things to the logical extremes, um, for example, the, uh, would our civilization survive if everyone had same-sex attraction? And, and That's not the logical extreme of that. That's not it. <laughs> That's uh, this strange slippery slope type of fallacy or just the fallacy of being completely uneducated about the evolutionary benefits of homosexuality all across, uh, not just the the human species, um, but uh, all across the animal kingdom. And there is no logical conclusion that just everyone will be gay and then like everybody will just like stop producing new children through heterosexual partnerships. That's not the logical conclusion, but that's the way that these brains work. We're like, well, if everyone was gay, that'd be a huge problem. So let's make sure that we demonize it and make sure that they are cast out the way that pedophiles are. Same thing, right? If everybody was gay, would we survive as a people or, or as people in general? Would there, would there still be? I'm just going to say this fabulous. as offensive as the racism conversation or worse. Yeah, and probably I would think we it would should. probably be a good idea to maybe stop it. But, uh, but I'm, I'm willing to kind of go there, but, but I don't you, think, I think we should stop this line, but Kara, I love what you were saying that led up to this. So I want to give you a chance to finish. Yeah. So basically Rod's point is when you go against certain principles, there's going to be pain involved and, the gospel is true. He has this analogy of these starfish that you're, we're just, we're here giving people reasons. People are leaving the church. We're just giving them more evidence or you're just throwing them into like a freshwater fish tank. And they're like, Hey, I can't survive in here. And what if there's the very system is actually not meant for human flourishing and thriving because people come from such diverse backgrounds and have diverse opinions. Should we actually all be forced to live within this system that didn't give black people the priesthood until 1978 and has all kinds of uh, biases and things against different communities on the margins that cause people to really feel like they're suffocating within it? Are, are you going to listen to those people? I know his point is that, well, if the church is true, they just don't know that it's good for them. So he's willing he, he believes so strongly, this is the problem with this, the, the, the Mormon fundamentalism is that when you hold so tightly to this belief, you believe so strongly in it, the empathy, the caring about other people, he even says right here, or, or John says to him, he's like, you need to talk to more LGBTQ people. He goes, I, I actually, have, I've researched this quite a, bot, a lot. <laughs> Again, my flippantness and I go, and it shows, she said sarcastically. But I do think that I was outrageously respectful because this is this is like a person you have to almost handle with kid gloves because you're just like is anything is there is the do you know how to get money out of an atm without getting robbed like how do you how did you get here today <laughs> how do you write books your ability to comprehend logic is astounding but the this is one of the best and brightest that the lds church so this is john explaining what treasure digging is which is also going to be helpful for the discussion that we have with hannah um all of these people i uh know about and i met because i went to the book of mormon evidence conference and they all work together they all kind of believe the same things they all have a very uh, young earth creationist view of the world and more importantly anything that doesn't fit within what they want to believe not just about god but about the mormon church specifically and joseph smith specifically and they will always make sure they arrive at their conclusion which is the same one that they started with <laughs> joseph smith great guy so basically in this clip, John DeLynn is asking Rod Meldrum point blank, all right, so there's these treasure digging practices where they would say, I have this divine power to see buried treasure underground. They'd go up to poor farmers and say, hey, you have treasure buried underground. They can do a little spell and they would have them start digging and they would say, oh, we did the spell wrong. Something happened. It mysteriously slipped away. But then the farmers would still pay Joseph Smith money. They'd say, oh, uh, the spirit took it away. No treasure. He was convicted of this in, in a, he was 
found guilty in a court of law of breaking the law and of engaging in illegal activities, scrying, glass looking, et cetera. That's, that's a well-established history that the modern Mormon church even acknowledges. Do you, how do you make sense of that illegal that. and disreputable behavior by Joseph Smith prior to his creation of the Book okay. of Mormon? All right, then that, that basically comes down to, in a court of law, you have uh, basically a hierarchy of witnesses, right? I mean, some witnesses are more credible than other witnesses. I mean, you, you bring in uh, expert testimony for certain areas. But wait, let me, okay, about so that. let me restate it. But let Do me, you agree that Joseph Smith engaged in treasure, treasure digging with the stone in the hat, yes or no? No. Okay. So you now, say he never did any of the, that. The, 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 the historical sources that I'm aware of, and I've read a lot of them, okay, is that he was hired to go and do work, physical labor for people who were looking for these things. They, they, they then claimed, well, you have a stone, you know, can you use this or whatever? Um, Joseph Smith actually tried to talk people out of the treasure digging. Okay, in, that's in several fine. instances. It's and not uh, so forth, but I didn't hear you mention that particular part of it. Um, but that, but was he engaged in that himself? Did he go out and start trying to find treasure himself? Why was it he was always working for someone else when he was doing that? Because they had money to pay him. Right, because he didn't have money to do this. But he was doing it to but make he, money. But but if he but he That's thought why. but if he thought he was going to get rich doing it, John, then why wouldn't he just go out and do it himself and not have to split the money with anybody else? Because there was no, no treasure, sense. and so there was no way to get rich. Yeah, but he, but if he <laughs> if he was really thinking that he had this ability to go out and find treasure, why was he poor almost his entire life? Or or he was fooling people <laughs> and engaging in a disreputable well, behavior, which is what well, it was. It, I, Rod Meldrum comes back with. Well, no, how come if, if he did that, like, why wouldn't he just go find the treasure himself? And it's like, there wasn't any treasure. That's what frauds do. He's like, well, he was poor his whole life. It doesn't matter. <laughs> he was poor. He was poor. And that's why he was engaging in this illegal folk magic practice was to make a little bit of money. And, jo and Rod Meldrum's like, well, if there was treasure, he would just go find it himself. Can't. I can't with this. Again, it comes down to who's writing the history. No, no, no. I, and and that's fine. We can argue sources. How, I just want to yeah. know what you believe. Yeah. So you believe you disagree with the modern Mormon church. The modern Mormon church came out with a gospel topics essay where it acknowledges that Joseph Smith used yeah. a stone in a hat to seek for buried treasure and no treasure was ever found. And then John DeLynn goes on to say, all right, so the gospel topics essays, the entirety of all of the people who work for the church, the historians, the apologists for the church, all of them all say that Joseph Smith engaged in treasure digging. He had a stone in a hat. And this is an act that he engaged in before he restored the church. And what do you think about that? And Rod Meldrum wants to come back with, well, it's it's more complicated than that. Because John's like, do you, Rod Meldrum, you disagree with all of the leaders of your church that that's what happened. And that's just a no from you. And he's like, well, it gets more complicated from that because people at the firm foundation and Hannah Stoddard, they all believe it's really fascinating. It's a big conspiracy theory. And I want to go into it actually more at the end, but basically it's that the, the liberals have taken over the history departments of BYU and of, of the church apologetics, and they're rewriting this new version of history. And then you have uh, Hinckley who's come in and says like, don't publish rough stone rolling. That's going to ruin the church. <laughs> and like it did technically lead a people out of the church, but that's what the history says. Like there's absolutely no more denying. There's no more snuffing this stuff under the rug because it's been percolating under the surface for so long. So the church is finally starting to be a slightly more transparent about it to inoculate members as they call it, to let them know, yeah, he treasure, he was doing some treasure digging, but we'll explain it to a con you and we'll explain it to you in a context where it makes sense. And when you do hear it, you won't be worried about it. Cause we already explained there's a context and it's just like the Yerm and Thummim and just like ancient prophets have been doing this forever. And so the church is completely that this is, this is pretty matter of fact. But it is important to this ultra-Orthodox Mormon's testimony, as Hannah will explain, that Joseph Smith cannot be a treasure digger. Don't care what the evidence says. He can't because prophets and treasure diggers, those are opposing things. Those are one satanic and one is like basically Jesus Christ. <laughs> there, yeah, so. Academic schooling and training, you are taught in no equivocal terms that basically you do not ever do a history from one viewpoint, from one vantage point. You have to you have to bring in all the different vantage points Love or to. else it's not an accurate history because then it becomes more propaganda right 
So this, so this is this is a uh, a thing that is taught to historians. This is something that they're supposed to do. You never you never tell a history from one viewpoint. So in doing so, Richard Bushman and others, Terrell Gibbons and others, have brought in other uh, eyewitness you know accounts. People like uh, you know like Mormonism unveiled and other uh, people who had an agenda against Joseph Smith. He says, well, they have a history too, and we can't just leave that out. So then Rod Meldrum goes on to say, well, if you look at how historians are taught to talk about history, they want to go through many different vantage points. And the problem is, is that they are giving credence to people whose testimonies to affidavits were in Mormonism unveiled. These affidavits that talk about Joseph's treasure digging and the people who actually interacted with him, why they don't think that they are credible. And so he makes a big point saying, well, the only sources that we have are these affidavits from people who hated Joseph Smith. And we're going to trust church historians who put the people who hate Joseph Smith on the same level with Joseph Smith and what he said and what all of our colleges said. And we know that these are people who restored the church versus people who wanted to tear it down. These people work for Satan over here. Like, why would you possibly care what they have to say? They say he's a treasure digger. Not even. He's my prophet, dude. Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Smith and their thing. So yeah, I totally see what you're saying. So this is yeah. in Rough Stone Rolling, for example, which I know is one you know a, a primary book that that uh, that you have people go and 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 read because it does. Bring, that the church wait it brings that both the sides church, out. That the church sells a Deseret book and commissioned right. church will Richard never Bushman lead to write. Members like, of the right. church said, Richard Bushman, we need a response to Fawn Brody. Right. Write a history of Joseph Smith, and then we'll sell the bejesus out of it. Richard yeah. Bushman did what the church <laughs> asked, and yeah. then the church sold a bajillion editions of, sold, of anyway, tens of yeah. thousands. Yeah. They yeah. sold tens yes. of thousands yeah. of copies of Rough Stone Rolling at Deseret Book, right. where your books are sold, by the way. Right. So like, so like, and, and just to cut this short, if you sat Richard Bushman down here, and I have, mm -hmm. or Patrick Mason, or Spencer Fluman, or any of these historians that said, so yeah. do you believe, Richard Bushman, that Joseph Smith used a stone in a hat to treasure dig, would say it was illegal, yes. and that it was not found, he would say yes. And that's yes. what the Gospel Topics essays right. say, and that's what the church would but, support. But that, but that is because of source documentation from people who said that they would drink the blood of Joseph Smith and would kill, kill him if okay. they had a chance, they're using that as okay. as their hard evidence that Joseph Smith was, you know, a, a, that so, the Smith family were. It's a lot more than that. So, so again, the logic here is that that Joseph Smith couldn't have done anything wrong that would make somebody mad enough to say that he would drink their blood. And I actually don't know where he's getting that exact quote from. If he's talking about Flassus Hurlbut, who is the researcher who collected these affidavits for Mormonism Unveiled, and I have a video that I did last week with Bill Real. But if you're saying like Joseph Smith, starting with the fact that he wasn't a treasure digger because that's satanic, he couldn't have done that. And then the character of the people who got these affidavits is suspect because they're twice excommunicated adulterers and then what they say about him is that he's involved in satanic stuff and he ripped them off and that they have a bunch of negative things to say about what it was like you know growing up and you're talking to people who who don't like the way that joseph smith ripped them off or what his family's character was like you're <laughs> If you're the type of like Mormon fundamentalist, and I'm not using that in the polygamist way, I'm not using it in the in the the most strict interpretation of scripture, uh, the most dogmatic version of what I'm trying to mean by fund fundamentalist here. Uh, yeah, you're going to say no matter what, I'm coming back to the assumption that he's a true prophet and then anything that people say about him that like they wanted to drink his blood. They, he's not going to he's not going to factor in the logic of why people were mad at him in the first place, because that can't be true. They can't be mad at him for him being a treasure digger because that's not true because that's satanic. It's just this total circular reasoning, motivated reasoning. They were drunks and that Smith was all you know into treasure so digging again, and so forth. So they're using people who had an agenda against Joseph Smith as primary source so, documentation, and then they have in, introduced that into so the church again, history. So again, and like yes, I disagree with that. So like geneticists, like geologists, yes. you basically say all the historians are wrong. Rod Meldrum. When people has have the, an agenda that they're going to kill Joseph Smith and drink his blood. Then yes, I think. But they why have would Richard totally, Bushman? Why I, would Richard Bushman and all the church historians and the Joseph Smith Papers because Project? Because they're wait, historians. The Can't question, get a word in edgewise. Why would they give credence to tainted sources if they're credible historians? 
Why would they do that? Especially, that is especially a great question to ask them. Especially when it would be in the church's disadvantage <laughs> to make those interpretations. It is in the church's disadvantage because when you bring into source documentation that comes from people who hated Joseph Smith with a passion, and you use that as primary source documentation of his character. Why are they doing it? it it's kind of like this, John. If somebody if somebody writes a book about about you and your character and they hit your guts, yeah, right. Would you want that to be the primary but, source document of, of who you why are? Why is a church person? headquarters doing this? Is my question. Can I ask because it they way? are sure. taking the they're taking the lead from Richard Bushman and these other people who are using these source documents because they're historians. They don't want to get hammered by their historian historian colleagues by say by by presenting a history that's only one sided. So, Kara, I want to I want to let you come in next, but I just want to restate what you just said. Richard Bushman, historian is beguiling and deceiving prophets, seers, and revelators in the corporate church in a way that's causing They're relying tens on his or hundreds, expertise. in a way yes. that's causing tens or hundreds of thousands of people every year to leave the church. And the prophets, seers, and revelators aren't inspired enough or smart enough to see that Richard Bushman is fooling and hurting everybody, and they're allowing it to perpetuate. I think, According the, to I think you. the prophets, seers, and revelators have asked us as members of the church to have the spirit with us so we can discern. But why did they sell his book at Deseret Book to the why tens did they of sell vampire books at Deseret? It's it's really it's fascinating. People like Rod Meldrum and Hannah Stoddard, they absolutely think that the church has been led astray. Just look at uh, what they have to say about Russell Nelson and people telling people to get the vaccine. So I, I asked them at the conference about that, and they're like. Well, sometimes the prophet can be part of the ways of the world. It's like, well, like you literally at this conference calling uh, the vaccine satanic. They are promoting satanic things on the side. They they can't understand that they're holding these two conflicting views at the same time because they just want to always still end up where they started. That it's still true, but it's it's in the way that I get to interpret it. The, the, thing, the thing about it is, is that the prophet seers and revelators of the church, they have a job to do. They have to administer the ongoing and worldwide aspects of the church. But care about people's they, faith. They, they don't have time to go into all the details about history. Nobody can be expert in everything. So they have to rely on the Terrell Gibbonses and the Richard Bushmans to, to, to give us the right history. But it's if they get faith. it wrong, it's, it's on them, not the brethren. Well, the brethren the, the, are the brethren empowering don't the, everything. the brethren are funding the historians it's, to lead people out of the church. So yeah, then John goes on to make another fantastic point, and all of his points were pretty much better than my points. So uh, looking back, the church is the, these prophets, seers, and revelators. They're leading tons of people to read a book that's based on false information and causing people to lose their faith. What kind of prophets, seers, and revelators are they then? And Rod Meldrum's like, well, yeah, sometimes that's what they have to do. They're more concerned with other things and they just, they kick the can down the road and they let the historians say what they want to say. And they just uh, regurgitate that. And it's like, so they're not prophets, seers, and revelators. They don't know tr their own history of the church. Like, what are you, what are you saying? And that the, the, the brother and the leaders of the church are literally empowering and funding <laughs> the websites that host this false information, according to them, that uh, help sell these books, that have them in their bookstores, that are literally causing people to lose their faith. But that's fine, because at the end of the day, like, people like to be on the inside. They like to be like in the know. It's this conspiratorial mindset that it's cooler to be in the know than not be in the know. And so you do believe that there are prophets, seers, and revelators, but you still know how to discern above them. And that gives them this, this this ego, this kind of like being on the inside perspective that they hold on to because being chosen by God is a big thing in Mormonism. Being called, being called out from like the mainstream that you know more than even the average Mormon who knows more about truth and spirituality and enlightenment and all of those things than just the person walking down the street in the entire world. It's all part of their identity and they cling on to it over anything even logic. All right. So this is just where my mind goes. Yeah. Stick with me here. So the whole like proposition of the church is that it's restored and it's led by prophets, seers and revelators. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and are they perfect? No, that's not my point. That's like, not even that's my point. Man. My po No. So, so it's, that's the proposition that it's led by prophets, seers and revelators. I'm trying to be so nice. is not even like part of the question. More, right. more the point is like, 
Um, Why they, would they allow this? They, no, they have the keys. Like I, I went through so many Sunday school lessons throughout the whole church that like the bishop holds these keys and the stake president holds these keys. And then yeah. uh, the area authority holds these keys. And then the prophet holds all of the keys. Right. And like the prophet is the person that you look to, to tell you right and wrong. We're so, we sing follow the prophet and everything centers around the authority of the church and those keys and things. Right. And then you have the gospel topics essays that say things like as a young man, Harda just added this. I believe this is in the gospel topics essays commissioned on, on the church's website. Like Christ has one true church. That means he has a website <laughs> from <laughs> the authority of his people who are to speak on earth. And they commissioned great point signed off on this to tell people as a young man during the 1820s, Joseph, like others in his day, used a seer zone to look for lost objects and buried treasure. Where that what do you make from? of that? The gospel topics essay that right. the church published. That? Like, well, I mean, okay. they, ha they have the authority and that's what they're telling people. You're, you're, they're telling you're asking people a guy lies? who for many years, um, it seemed that as though the church was promoting a Central American theory. And, um, Deflect. and, and we obviously disagree with that. We haven't been censored. We haven't been had any any issues with that. So, the fact that the church at one point in time had these particular uh, positions and uh, yeah, and and when it comes down to that, the, you know, the brethren have to rely on people who have expertise in their particular fields. If those people That's get you. it wrong, Is that you? That's not you. Then what is their what is their position to say? Well, Richard Bushman, you're wrong. You don't know that you don't know the history. No, they they're going to go with Richard Bushman and his history. So it's on Richard Bushman to tell the the uh, the, the, the history um, in a factual way. So they're relying on people who are lying. Are they not? Richard Bushman is not lying. These I are these are actual he historical like, documents. I thought you said that he but his like sources, Mormonism unveiled. His, his sources, sources to me are, are suspect. Many of the sources that Richard Bushman relies on are suspect because they themselves said that they hated Joseph Smith. Okay, so like, for instance, Rock in the Hat, Joseph Smith, 18 different treasure digs. He's looking around, never finds anything. That never happened. If, if Joseph Smith is a treasure digger, he stunk at it because he was always poor. <laughs> that's the point. Though. Like, no, Rock, listen, that's like the point. Like, there's no you such know, thing as treasure digging. Like, yeah. there's no such thing as buried treasure. You know, like no rot seriously what look, that speaks there's to no is such that, thing as a, that's why he was poor <laughs> what that speaks to is that he was potentially deceiving people who believed there was treasure you have to understand that right he's like no that no. that's the that's the idea you understand that that's the idea it, it's well I the fact that I, joseph I was that's taking the people on treasure about days smith. That's the like people yeah, people the who fact, believed in him yeah that that he would lead them to treasure but Joseph Smith shut down. I mean, you know, if you look at, I'm exhausted. Uh, I'm like the, the guy that he was doing that the uh, the digging for Josiah Stoll. Josiah Stoll. I, mean, I was having a good time though. To get Josiah Stoll to stop doing after this. After he nothing collected there. the money, Rod. After he, he collected was, the money, he was a laborer getting paid for labor. That's your interpretation, Josiah. So what, it, Emma's own different. Emma's own dad wrote an affidavit. Well, he digging. he hated Joseph. That's Emma's own so it doesn't father, matter. Anyone an hates witness. Joseph, we don't care. He did not say Joseph was just a shovel bearer digging. He said Joseph Smith was leading the silver mine treasure expedition. Just read Isaac Hale's affidavit that he signed and swore that was Emma's own dad, who was an eyewitness, not that Joseph was just a shovel digger. You, you're, you're ignoring the evidence that doesn't conform with your views. Well, I'm not, I'm not ignoring it. I'm, I'm, I, I am aware not of aware of that. Of that okay, apparently. go read Isaac, Isaac Hale's yeah. affidavit. And you'll yeah. see that. He no, they're all aware of it. They know what's out there. And if it doesn't conform to what they believe about how a prophet should act, because he is treasure digging, they just go, no, they'll, they'll throw it out. That he testified that Joseph was leading the treasure dig with a stone I, and a half. Do you believe that God will ever let the prophets to lead its members astray? Uh, no. I okay. think that God would That's actually fine. take okay. him. Take so him. you don't believe that? Yeah. Okay. And there's Ballard recently but saying, like, stay in the boat. And well, right. that, this is this is the path. Right. But does that mean that they can't make mistakes? See that there's there, there's a fine line here. No, no, the difference is yeah. Rod. The difference is if the prophets are listening to somebody whose evidence is a, of an event that didn't happen. That's like leading, you're saying, that, John Delin, did you hire a female co-host so that you could talk over her? No, you didn't. <laughs> Listen. Okay, so that's the second in which as I was. Trying to make a point. People think that this was like a lot more tense between me and John than it actually was. Um, 
you can tell that John is is trying to make these points and he's honing in and he has a very specific question like a prosecution wants to ask. And I've got a million questions running through my head. And so I think we're both talking over each other a little bit, but I did feel um, like John did not even want me there and he could have done that interview on his own. And it is very difficult when you're live streaming something like this um, where I've done a bajillion of these live streams, whether they're interviews or we're talking into the camera and we're presenting something with slides uh, where I feel, I feel confident, but it is very difficult to say and rattle off what's on your mind <laughs> with also looking over to make sure that your boss is not like, stay on tone, don't F this up, you know? So that anxiety is just always, always going on in me when, whether it's a live stream or not. And so it was at the second where it, ha it had little to do with the fact that he was talking over me, but it's this anxiety that I just don't want to be co-hosting with John. I love him. He just can get very intense in interviews. And I, I have had enough board meetings at that point and disagreements with John at that point. And we always worked through everything, but it just is, it's like a marriage where you love the person, you respect them, you can live with them. Me and John basically had like a work marriage, but there just does come a point where it's like, how many times are I going to have to go through the same cycle again, where I just feel like I I can't trust myself that I'm going to say something that's not going to piss off somebody or, or John. And he has to trust me to be able to like, give me the mic. And so there is an immense amount of trust between co-hosts, especially when you're live like that. And the best part about John Dillon is how much trust he had in me from the very beginning. And I just lived in that confidence and I was able to, to talk and become a better interviewer over time. And he totally, I, I wasn't my idea to start like leading interviews and doing interviews myself, but he was super encouraging and believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. So there's all of those parts of John that are like, I'd say like 95% to 5% that, and the 5% is just sometimes the frustrating ones, the ones that just like peak my anxiety. And I'm like constantly living in this, the cycle of just, I don't even want to, I don't want to, I don't want to repeat this cycle again. We've done this before. I don't like feeling like this. And so this is this moment. So I'm trying to make a point right now. I, I a lot of people talk about John talking over people and stuff and I don't care. People talk over each other and it's, it's, it's all very conversational and it's not really that big of a deal, but it's this moment right here that just my anxiety was peaked happen. It's like leading. you're saying, John Delin, did you hire a female co-host so that you could talk over her? No, you didn't. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> love you so much. So no, I, I'm trying to say is like, so at that moment, I'm uh, at a 10 out of 10 panic attack and <laughs> trying to keep going. Cause at that exact moment, um, John does, John, John truly has been uh, amazing at hiring a female co-host and he treated me fan fabulously. Um, and we've had disagreements and he's not like things that I've said on live streams. And I'm not like things that he said on live streams. I have some, I have some things I could say, but, um, overall it just, in that moment, the, the trust was gone from me to him and from him to me. Cause right when I said that, and I said, John Dillon, did you hire a female co-host so that you could talk over her? Kind of like a tongue in cheek kind of thing. And at that second, he had like his stuff in his lap and he gives me this look of death. <laughs> he just gives me this look like, and I go, oh, I'm in trouble. And I took out my phone and right after I finished saying this and I literally went, hi, Gerardo. Um, I'm either quitting or I'm fired. Please clear your schedule and replace me. <laughs> you can ask Gerardo. And so I am just panicking and I'm just like, well, I'm done. I, I can be doing other stuff. I can be doing TikToks and YouTube videos. And this, this, this furnace is uh, not my favorite right now. And people were really kind and said that, you know, Carrie, you did better than I would have done. And I absolutely did not do as well as I could have done because I was absolutely just, I was just like, this is the most, I cannot believe this is my life. I cannot believe this. This all has to do with this insane fundamentalist worldview that leads to some really harmful beliefs. So finish this. Did, does God have a prophet right now in Nel in president Nelson, uh -huh. who is allowing people to John's point to be, to I'm like, please, I'm like, everything's fine. Love you so much, John, to John's wonderful, fabulous point. Leave something about Joseph Smith that causes them into faith crisis to leave the church, to abandon their covenants, to 
be forced into outer darkness? Is, is God allowing a prophet to uphold events about Joseph Smith that caused faith crises of something that didn't happen and is just an invented narrative by people who are had it out for Joseph Smith? Okay, so maybe to just ask that, that first off, I don't know the will and mind of God, but I do know this about God, and that is that he allows, he, he, he's given each one of us freedom and agency. I don't believe that his prophets are, are allowed to basically take that freedom and agency away from anybody, including members of the church. So when there is additional information that comes out and so forth, people have to make up their own minds. In my particular case, I choose to have faith. I choose to believe. Um, and, it, and then I, I, I got to try to find evidences and things that back up that belief, okay? But when it comes down to prophets, seers, and revelators, are they prophets, seers, and revelators? Yes. Do they, do they teach us that, that we are to be commanded in all things, that they're, that they're going to give us direction in all things? And the answer to that is, of course, no. That would go against the directive of God himself, who basically says that we are, are, we are free to make choices and do, and do things. So do they deliberately lead people into paths of, that would cause faith crisis? And I think the answer to that is no. Do they allow people to have to make choices and things so that they have to choose? Do I believe in the, um, the, the accounts of people who wanted to drink the blood of Joseph Smith? Do I believe their accounts over Oliver Cowdery's accounts? That's, that's a subjective thing. Joseph has admitted to this. Oliver Cowdery, there is a court trial. This is not just like he wants to group it, and so does Hannah Stoddard, that it's just these affidavits collected for more, that are in Mormonism unveiled versus the prophet. And this is just another, it's a black and white fallacy. There's absolutely more, uh, there's way more than that. This is a very stunted way of thinking. This is an either or a black and white fallacy. You have to decide who you're going to believe. All right. And, and, but, but without that ability to make yeah. a choice between the two, you see the problem? Then, no. then, it, then, then it's just the, 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 the Lord's prophets just guiding, directing people to say, okay, John, you got to do this, you got to do that, got to do this, got to do that. That's fine. It's way more nuanced than that. There's, there's a lot more freedom within the church than people think to, to think different things. I mean, pe so people saying, thought about Central the America. Follow the prophet less is what I hear. What's that? Follow the prophet less. There's free no, agency. That's not what you're. That's not that's what I'm saying. What you said that the prophet. The prophets give people allow free different yes. ideas to come forward. That the, the prophets have taken no position on Book of Mormon geography, but you know that I'm very much in favor of the Heartland theory. I've heard some things. And, There's uh, some rumors. <laughs> and, and, and uh, John Sorensen and, and 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 Jack Welch and so forth are all on the other camp. That's okay. We're all in the same tent here, but we can but have like, different down opinions. to like down to like Russell M. Nelson. Yeah. putting his face in a white hat thing. This is how Joseph Smith did it. That's like right. that seems like to me, like, well, no, that, that he said that's, that's, as I understand it, that's how it was done. Right. So I, he I, said I would love to go into the translation process thing and the whole stone in the hat thing. I'm sorry. We should be getting into Heartland. That's but this is like, I think, I think we made the point. I think I, we're circling down the drain. I, I would <laughs> circle a lot more. All I want. Yeah. That's uh John speak to me of like, you know, shut up Kara. <laughs> And I'm just like, oh, but I have more questions. What I, what Rod is showing is he's consistent, whether it's science or history. If there's ever history that conflicts with a favorable narrative of Joseph Smith, he's going to favor the historical documents that are favorable to Joseph Smith and dismiss or marginalize any documents that, that make Joseph Smith. And that's the uh, truth. That How do you feel about that? Joseph Smith Let me just check in with Rod. If, if, How do you feel about what John I'm like, if, what do you If think somebody about? writes a history of Rod Meldrum sometime in the future and, and the historian decides to use people who, you know, who hated me or whatever as the primary source document. What if they had a reason to hate you? What if they had a really good reason? Do people not have good reasons to hate skewed, people? And you know that that would be the case if people hate yeah. Joseph Smith and, then, and they're using the primary source documentation for his character and his life. I'm telling you, Joseph Smith had an amazing character. Those who hated him, you can lose those who loved him or those who are in between and didn't really care one way or the checked. other. I was just like... But those who loved him talk about his character. I'm telling you, from what I've read of those accounts... Joseph Smith's character was utmost. Mm -hmm. and, okay. I, and, I, and I I would put him up against anybody as far as uh, having having the character to be, I mean, put it this way, are you willing to die for your beliefs? So stupid. 
I'm not willing to die for dogma. That's a different <laughs> <laughs> that's the more right. that's a different thing i mean it, it, it a, shows a level of commitment though that he that he would go yeah. to even you know to be arrested numerous times and it would have been so much easier for him to just say you know what this this is this is horrible my family's suffering everybody's suffering i just if i just renounce my my fakeness and so forth you know if i'm faking all this stuff if I just renounce all that, everything would be over. I'd be just a normal guy doing my normal. Should should, uh, should all of the other false cult leaders all just do that when uh, the United States government is coming in to knock down their compound? Or should Warren Jeffs have done that when he saw all of the women and children being taken off on buses uh, at the Yearning for Zion Ranch? Should he be like, whoa, I didn't mean to do this with like everyone's kids getting taken away. No, false prophets. <laughs> They keep doing false prophet things. Doesn't matter. Like it is, I like that point is so obvious. But to people like Rod Belgium, they cannot possibly conceive that like Joseph Smith was a false prophet, and it's just like every other false prophet who doesn't give up the game. Like he can't possibly hold that in his head. I mean, you look at so many others. You can, so you can right here, to look right here. I was like, I'm leaving. I'm quitting. <laughs> Either I'm quitting or I'm fired, but I'm leaving. And so that's why I said what I said right here. <laughs> And people are like, Kara, you're too flippant. I was like, you hadn't seen any flippantness yet until what I did right here. If you want to see, <laughs> this is me knowing that like, I am leaving after this interview. I am not coming back. If John wants me to come back, I won't be coming back. Um, we went through a whole rigmarole where I was like, you could give me this X amount of money that I know you won't give me, but like maybe I could figure a way to come back for this amount of money and completely restructure everything to which I knew that he would say no, which he did say no, which is fine. Because I was so out from this second out, I was checked the F out and in panic attack mode, to which I did. I went into the back corner um, right the second later and just started bawling. It was just like it had nothing to do with Rod yet. It was really just like John and I, we broke our trust was just it was done. We we're just it was the last crack of just he doesn't trust me. I don't trust him. We can't keep doing this. We can't keep working together where we have to have a sense that when I say something, you're not going to go off camera. It's going to give me a freaking panic attack. And it's a high, it's a high stakes situation. And so I haven't told that story <laughs> before because I don't want people to think that John is just like some controlling monster because he truly isn't. And we had to have a whole board meeting. Um, after this, I just said, I don't, I don't feel like I don't want to work. I don't, I, I don't want to be part of this. Um, let's just not talk for a couple of weeks. And I apologize for saying that to John because he has been very gracious in every way. And that was just a joke. And that does not look good. <laughs> it's not something that I want people to think about John Dillon genuinely that like he, he likes talking over people. Cause I don't feel that way. People, you might be a Mormon stories listener and you might think that way, but I think that he's a great, great interviewer and he's a very kind, empathetic person in so many arenas. And then I said this. I don't know what we would family. do if we were Joseph, because right. I'm right. also not banging 40 women. Like, there's a lot of things Joseph was doing that, well, like, maybe was... he had a reason. Let, let, let me tell you, though. Um, it's, he was, he wasn't be banging okay. 40 women. John hated when I said that. I just know. There's so much, There's a couple times in the interview where I was like, your prophet was a sexual predator. I could have said it better, but I'm just like, I don't care. I'm out of here. <laughs> Yeah. I'm sorry for saying that. I'm just saying, Can like, move on? there's other. There's, there's no evidence for that at all, genetically okay, so or in any things. other way. All I'm trying so, to say, Rod, uh, is I'm like, just, I'm just here to defend you. We don't know. The dream. I'm just saying, <laughs> you see John's we don't know the reasons why people don't give up when the odds are against them. It doesn't have to necessarily mean that it's true, but I'll That's stop true. talking. Okay, but you have to be no, pretty no, no, committed. I, but you have to be. You realize you have to be gonna, pretty committed to be able to put your life on the line. Okay. I'm gonna open this. Commitment does not okay, yeah, a profit yeah. so, Rod, make. Sorry. The point, the, the, the... Yeah, and then I went in the back and I talked to Jen. So yeah, Jen Jen Camp was off there in the corner and I was just like, that was what I said. That was, that was bad. I was like, John was giving me like, shut the hell up, Kara <laughs> vibe. And he's never done it to that degree before. The The closest thing is after a live stream once. Uh, I, I, I eventually have to get in and tell these stories, but I just don't trust that the internet audience will be able to take them in full context. So I don't feel like sharing a lot of these stories, but there's one other time where after a live stream where John and I were responding to an apologist video about us, about John. And I said something and John, right after it was over, you usually look at the other person. You're like, good. How are we, we good? Everything good. Like, did I do? Okay. You did great. I like that part, you know? And John just took off his headphones and like threw them down. And he's like, no, what the F was that? <laughs> and I was like, uh. and then that, turned into a little bit of a problem. I apologized 
I can say when I'm wrong <laughs> and I know I'm not perfect. So we get over things and we move on. And John has had an incredible amount of trust in me. So yeah, I go off back into the corner. I'm, I'm in hyper, I am panic attack. My whole life is like, I'm, I'm quitting right now. I was like, I've come to the realization. It came right in the face. And sometimes for me, I do not, I, I keep going with things until something physically tells me to stop. So I will just work and work until I get really sick. And like when I was working at Mormon Stories, I had a really bad throat problem. And my doctor told me that it was because this, this problem is uh, common with high achieving women. And so I was like, oh my gosh, I came in for the diagnosis and he called me a bad bitch. That's so great. So I will, I will get sick or something has to just smack me in the face till it tells me that you should not be here anymore. And I knew, I was like, this is that moment. I don't want to be here anymore. And I have the rest of the story. I've told it a million times, but overall I love, love, love my time at Mormon stories. Um, it's just a very intense job. It's a very 24 seven type of job. And so just a quick sentence about Jen camp. John has never told me that I can't say anything that I want to say. He said, Carrie, you can make an entire video about all the things that I've done that are wrong. And again, people just take that and just think that that's what's true of the parts is true of the whole, you know, that other fallacy. And John is not this monster that people paint him out to be. Um, I know that like Midnight Mormons has made fun of John for like calling 911 about a meme. And that happened right before I started working there. And I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't have let John do that. And I make fun of him about it. I'm like, I'm on their side. I was like, yeah, that was dumb. I don't like, so there's a lot of things that John does that are really frustrating. And, and when you leave Mormon stories, it's a huge relief because it's like, this is not my monkeys, not my circus kind of feeling anymore. And I, cried to Jen in the back corner. There was a miscommunication with me and John. He was texting. He's like, where'd you go? And I was like, I don't think you even want me there. And there was a miscommunication where he said something to the effect where it made it look like he didn't want me there. He's like, no, that was a typo. You should have seen that was a typo. And I was like, well, I'm like crying over here. I can't even read my screen. So it was this big miscommunication. And I felt like he didn't even want me there. So I didn't even come back for like 30 minutes. I was just in the back corner, like calming down. And then it was frustrating because then in the board meeting, like two weeks later, um, I, I just didn't feel seen <laughs> where I just, I, I didn't feel quite seen enough. And, uh, Jen was in that board meeting as a matter of fact, and hindsight's 2020. And now I realized there was a lot of things that Jen was doing where she was gunning for my job and she was doing things behind my back to, uh, stoke fear and stoke frustration and tell lies and say things to John that I said about him that I didn't say. And there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. I had no idea. Me and Jen were like coworkers. We were good friends. And she came to my birthday party. It was all well and good and fine. I was obviously confiding in her and crying on her shoulder. I go home that she was like the first person I called when I got home um, a couple hours later. And I was just like, well, I don't want to quit because I know that you're going to have to like have all these responsibilities. And now hindsight's 2020 where I, she was fine. She was stone cold sober. Like the, she was completely looking back at it now, the things that she said to me, it was somebody who had been kind of playing a little bit of a game in the background uh, to be like, oh, you're quitting. Oh, and I get to be co-host. Very interesting. Very interesting indeed, you know? And so people people have comments about Jen's performance as a co-host and she's not a content creator. She doesn't spend a lot. She just left the church. So overall, my my general sentiment then and now is like, go easy on Jen. She literally was only pulled in because I kind of abruptly quit. And it's, it's the best that we, they had to work with. And I also think people should go easy on Jen, uh, because I cried in every board meeting. I still made my points and I still like took ownership for the pl places that I did. And that's a normal emotive part of life. So, um, people are missing the wider thing about the situation with Jen. And I do believe that it comes more down to a, serious manipulative extortion but generally speaking John has been incredibly gracious and just as as a person he's a very growth minded person that's the only reason I'm still friends with him if he was just like this asshole that people paint him as like do you think that I would just be friends with him and so it's a really frustrating thing that Jen called me and told me um that she's going to be putting me in this lawsuit and saying some things that are so verifiably false. Like, oh my gosh, can't wait for you guys to see the evidence. They're just, they're just made up. They're just false things. And when she was telling me about what she was going to be doing, um, and I said something back to her that I thought was pretty nonchalant. And she just like went from, uh, really just building me up and saying, Kara, I just think the world of you. And then when I'm like, okay, 
but she's like, oh, you're on John's team, huh, Kara? I thought more of you. Kara, you were just like them. You're just like them. Anyway, she just like gets enraged at me and she's like, have a nice life and hangs up on me. So um, not cool to stab people in the back. Not cool to make up lies. Not cool to extort uh, donor money for $215,000. It's just because John has... He has a, a an intense work environment. He's in no way, shape, and form a, a, any kind of sexual predator, any kind of sexual harasser. In my experience, is what I will speak to, and what Jen is saying about those experiences. Um, they're not. They're just. They're they're like flatly made up fabrications. Um, and one day I can tell you the whole entire context and the truth of things, but I'll have to save that for another video. So yeah, that's the instance that I knew I was never coming back to Mormon stories ever again. Uh, then John's like, well, what about the once a month John Larson episodes? And I told John Larson, uh, no, like I just, it's too triggering. I just want to be done. I don't want to think about it. It's a, not my monkeys, not my circus situation. John shoots himself in the foot sometimes. And I don't want to be his defender. I want John's business to be his business. And I want to go do other things. I love interviewing people. I love my time at Mormon Stories. I made so many amazing connections. Makes me so happy that this is the life I live. This is the incarnation I was blessed with. But um, I need to I need to move on. I need to close this chapter and do something else. I need to take care of my kids more and be more in tune with their needs. And I can't do that um, in this type of situation with this job. So Jen took over, Jen, um, canceled their insurance. <laughs> so if they ever get sued, um, they won't be protected and <laughs> so many things, but don't think that I am just like, John's the best and he could never do anything wrong. It's just like people like me and Samantha Shelley that are like some of his good friends that are in his life. He has people in his life that tell him like, Hey, don't do this. Hey, don't do that. And Anyone who is trepidatious about John DeLynn and you see me, I would hope you would see a person who like doesn't put up with bullshit who's <laughs> like, um, hey, knock this off. He is able to take in that information and like grow and learn from it instead of just being, uh, you know, a hardened asshole about it. So the John that I know is very gracious and very understanding and he's professionally, yes, but just personally in my interpersonal life, like I count him as one of my, my very best friends and he's helped me through emotional, I can call it midnight crying about anything. And he's, he's very nice, very helpful, um, very sweet, very sincere. And he knows that the, this space is, is dominated by men and he wants to break down patriarchy too. And so he looks at me and he's for my first Mormon stories interview. And she's like, she's funny. She's articulate. Let's care. Do you want to be my co-host? And I was like, uh, who me? I just like, had a baby and I downloaded TikTok like three months ago, this old girl. So he's been amazingly gracious, both financially with health insurance things. I had to go to the ER at 4 a.m. And he's like, what's the bill? Just paid it off. But to work for, can he be super frustrating? Yes. Am I probably a frustrating person to work with? Yes. So it takes two people who can like come to the table and have accountability and own their shit. And I have so many board meetings that I would love to share with the public that are like, okay, Kara, you need, you need to calm down. And, and John, you need to calm down. And looks like you guys both calm down. And you guys are both like totally on the same page again. And you just needed to understand because there was a misunderstanding. And now you're back at, at the same place again. So John and I have always worked through every issue that we've had. And he's been, he's been amazing. So so I think I'm going to have to turn this into a two-part video because I want to save my reaction to Hannah Stoddard saying that Joseph Smith was not a treasure digger. I want to be able to keep that as its its own reaction, its own video, but at least this video kind of lays the groundwork, explains why I left Mormon stories. And also I just got news that, um, so just people know John has never said what I can say, what I can't say. Um, but just for legal reasons, because I am named, um, as a person that she doesn't like <laughs> in her lawsuit, um, it's difficult to comment on things. And I also got news just now that Jen Camp loses her anti-stalking petition against John DeLynn. She has to pay all court fees and her claims are been completely baseless. And this is just the part of the story that I can talk about right now. The lawsuit is different. The, the things that 
Jen claimed in her video about working for Mormon stories, um, I could talk about it for a long time. I could react and say where I'm like, I can see where she's talking about here. I think that she, I think that she is just a very sensitive person and that's not a crime, but making up lies and allegations about somebody, especially ones that are very serious that I take seriously and John Dillon takes seriously. I dislike two people in this entire ex Mormon space. Guess who they are. <laughs> but if I ever have to tell that entire long story, I eventually will. But I have to talk about people that I don't like. And I don't really want to spend my time talking about things that are just dramatic. But overall, um, I would still completely still support Mormon stories. But more importantly, the Nuanso YouTube channel. I'm sorry to put this at the end of the video, but it just got word. So what I said to somebody on Facebook, they're basically talking about how like any person should be wary of employment there at the OSF. And like to an extent, I agree with that. It's it's a very difficult job. You have to wear a lot of hats and it's very exhausting. And uh, John says he's not a perfect boss. I know he's not a perfect boss. Is he an abusive boss? Absolutely not. You see a sexual harasser? Absolutely not. So the one comment that I will say is I said in response to this person, I like your comment. I can see where you're coming from. Here's the realest, most honest take I can give as being this close and being named in the lawsuit by Jen. There are grains of truth in some aspects of what she said has happened, aspects or themes perhaps, absolutely none of the sexual ones for sure, and the counter evidence we have but haven't shown would make everyone's jaws drop. I and a few people know the situation, but grains of truth to an overbearing work environment do not a $222,000 highly, highly, highly fabricated, methodically calculated extortion plot make. So that's my final piece on that. I have to split this up into a two-parter, but at least I laid the groundwork for this so you understand what I'm talking about, this type of clan, this type of faction of Mormonism. And I will do the reaction to Hannah's video tomorrow um, to her saying that Joseph Smith was not a treasure digger. And she even says, in fact, if like, like, are we supposed to believe that Joseph Smith got the first vision and then he went back to the hill to visit the angel Moroni to retrieve the plates four times and all that time he was treasure digging, like involved in the occult and like satanic stuff while he's preparing to be prophet? That's that's not a prophet I would follow. That's not of Christ. That's not of God. I've had better spiritual experiences than that and I would not follow him whatsoever. She gets like really, and it's like, oh my gosh. So like if I... So like if you were just open to the evidence that he actually was a treasure digger, which I can provide for you, it has nothing to do with Mormonism Unveiled because for playing by your rules, I am not going to listen to the Flasses Hurlbut affidavits. Those are off the table. What else do we have that says he was in? And to what extent do we have that? So I have 50 slides to show you. So I'm excited for that. So tune in. Uh, but I will leave you with um, a little fun taste in your mouth of just a few things from the comment section. Um we go as follows. Uh, thank you, Hannah, for this video. Anti-Mormons are the biggest liars and are intellectually dishonest. They don't care about truth. They just care about their own narrative. Some of the most hateful, vindictive people anywhere. Uh, as we saw, Rod Meldrum, um, people like this, they uh, don't want to sign marriage certificates for other American citizens um, based on the bigotry that they learn from this church. So there's leave the church, leave it alone. I'm going to call out things. If you want to call it vindictive, I'm sorry that that's the way your brain and biases have to operate. But yeah, I want to see Hannah debate an academic heavyweight on the subject. This guy's like an anti-Mormon apologist or an anti-Mormon heavyweight. There's no such thing. And the other guy's like, uh, you know, that like, to disagree with what Hannah says, you don't even have to be anti-Mormon. And it's this whole thing around like ex-Mormons are going to be so triggered by this. I'm like, is there, okay, like tr trigger <laughs> triggered ex-Mormon. So on one account, like, I guess, yes, that this belief is highly fundamentalist. Um, and I want to call it out because it has no place in civil society and you are a quintessential class, classic reactionary and fundamentalist because that's what they do when society is progressing one way. They go back. You guys cannot accept the – you guys are triggered. <laughs> like you can't accept something about treasure digging that is so clearly outlined by your own church that you're willing to go to a young earth creationist street fighter 
pick pick your player. That's what you want to go with. That's cool. And last but not least, the anti-Mormons will be here soon, screaming about how Joseph Smith was, in fact, a money digger. Just remember this analogy of mine. Remember when you were a little kid out in the playground trying to play soccer during recess, and there was one kid who would just not get with the program? He'd either complain about specific rule being broken, or how one kid stepped on the back of his shoe and the game needed to be stopped so he could get his shoe back on, or how one kid was kicking the ball too hard. He wanted to be part of the game, but also not be part of the game. He would cry and scream and argue. Remember that kid? Well, he grew up to be an anti-Mormon. I was like chill as when I was a kid. Now I know those kids. Those kids were playing tag on the playground and us school kids, we were playing kickball because we were badass. And the only thing I complained about was right field is mine. I this, this throw it out of my area. Whether they used to be Mormon or not, anti-Mormons are fascinated with the church. They want to be part of it, but also not be part of it. I don't want to be part of the church. I mean, my family's part of the church. I can't help that. I have, I have parts of my life that uh, I live in a state that has like a theocracy because it's run by so many legislators that are part of the church. Um, as a person who has general interest in human psychology and the best way to get somebody out of a high demand religion, out of a cult, is them listening to other people who have left that religion, that system. So this is, this is not about you guys being Mormon. You guys are going to people like this, you're going to stay exactly where you are, but there are going to be people who are looking for validation that they feel like they're taking crazy pills and the system isn't working for them anymore. I don't want to be part of the church, but I do want to be able to comment on it and call out the devil speak and the fallacious reasoning and the harm that it does. So if people feel like it's time to get out and they need to hear somebody else validate their feelings through YouTube videos or podcasts or words or Mormon stories interview, that's what we do. Every different religious system has people on the outskirts. It's just not even a religious system. There's people, there's a collegiate athlete situ so associations. It, it, so like by the same logic, um, what's her name? Um, hey Siri, what's the name of the girl from King of Queens? Okay, I found this on the web. Leah what's the name of the girl? Leah Remini, when she talks about Scientology and all of the harm, and she goes on podcasts and she has an entire TV show about it and her experiences in it and helps other people get out. Does she also want to be in Scientology, but also not be in it? You just, you center yourself in the narrative a little bit too much, you guys. <laughs> we sure have had some fun today, haven't we? Nuance out here. Sadly, the power went out right at this time in this recording. Uh, I blame Satan. Uh, obviously. And I didn't get a wrap up this very, very good video that was totally cohesive in every way, except for this one right now. I didn't jump around from subject to subject and everyone who's gotten to this point in the video really loves it and loves what I did here. So come back tomorrow where I will have uploaded the second video in this fun D series where I respond in detail to the head of the Joseph Smith Foundation, a fundamentalist intellectual heavyweight according to the midnight mormons comment section and daughter my mother never had hannah stoddard saying joseph smith was not a treasure digger not once the only treasure he ever touched were emma smith's sacred buoys and if you're already a supporter of this channel thank you so so much check out my links um down below on how to donate and tell me your favorite thing a mormon didn't believe when you showed them the evidence mine is a book on child psychology, explaining how my children have big emotions, so please stop saying they're possessed by Satan. Mm -hmm. So that's why we don't go to grandma's much anymore. <laughs>